Okay, thank you very much. A pleasure to be here today. I realise I'm the seventh speaker and probably the fourth economist, and I'm billed to talk about economic strategy, so not the most uh, accelerating fees, but I'll try and make it as practical as I can. And I've got some slides, which again, I'll go through at pace, and uh, I'll leave them with you. I suppose what I'm going to try and do is bring the threads of it together in terms of the economic, social and environmental and give you an update on the thinking within government around, Charlie mentioned the wellbeing economy and how you try and develop a framework that allows you to build in, build in the tensions and manage the transitions because really we're in a period now that's all going to be about transitions, whether it's climate change, whether it's changes to the artificial intelligence, changes in the labour market, uh, we're in a transition post Brexit as well with different trade deals. So it's all about kind of managing the transition, transitions. And the other thing I'll emphasize, emphasize is the importance of place and the role of local authorities, which is the place agenda has really come back really strongly. And I think it kind of cements the role of local government in that. So I have a number of slides, but I'm going to be quick. I'm going to try and be quite provocative if I can. And we'll get to a point then, hopefully, that you use a got the time back that you uh, sacrifice for your coffee and stuff. So economic, oh, so this is, so I'll say something about this group as well called the Wellbeing Economy Governments uh, at the end and that's all I need to say about that, okay. So the, the kind of backdrop to this, the evolve, evolving economic strategy in Scotland. So we started, the updated strategy was published in March 2015 and it kind of brought in the social dimension much stronger. There was two pillars to addressing uh, having a competitive economy alongside tackling inequality. So you know the backdrop to that, the, the, the work post-financial crisis, the, the growth in inequality within advanced economies, the work from the OECD, IMF, that actually uh, inequality, even if you were only interested in growth, was a barrier to growth. Less cohesive societies don't do as well. So that was really... The, the two pillars. There was four eyes within that. The fourth one was inclusive growth. And I'll say a little bit more about that because when we published the strategy, we weren't in no way experts in inclusive growth. We'd lifted a lot of the work from the OECD and actually we tried to operationalise it since 2015 and along, along with the other three eyes, which I won't run through. And the next pillar, I'll say a little bit about that as we go on the inclusive growth agenda. And then you've got the National Performance Framework, which is, in a sense, is our kind of whole of, whole of Scotland approach to this. And then this is, what, this is where I want to end up in the wellbeing economies. What does wellbeing mean? And is that a better framing for this? So my proposition is that, essentially, wellbeing, thinking about uh, societal wellbeing, how people are treated, how they live, homelessness, child poverty, alongside economic well-being, do we have a competitive economy that provides well-paid quality <coughs> jobs, that can provide taxes to invest in public services, along with environmental well-being, which is broader than just carbon, it's about ecosystems, the air quality, the water systems, and in one sense, well-being, I think, is a terminology, a framing, which allows the three of those to come together, but I'll say a little bit more about that, you can challenge me on that at the end. So very quickly on the NPF, the National Performance Framework, I think, so this is the 11 outcomes. Again, I won't say much about this, but if you think of what Charlie had said about uh, circular systems, all of these 11 outcomes are interdependent. You know that day in, day out, so the work you do at local authority level. And the quote that's there, I use quite a lot because in one sense, coming from the economic part of the government, we're trying to emphasise that growth is just a, growth is not a means to an end. Growth is only important in the sense that it enhances people's uh, quality of life, provides opportunities to participate, doesn't de degrade the environment. So this is the type of uh, framing, you could call it the, the donut framing or whatever, but it's, it's, it's kind of growth, growth for a means rather than anything else. And Again, I won't, I won't the, the slides will be there if you want to have a look at this. I think in the last one, the poll, which I'm sorry I missed, was about uh, inclusive growth. And sometimes when you introduce a new term, uh, people unpick the term and say, I don't like the growth part, the kind of growth. It has to be more inclusive, it has to be this or that. 
And we, one of my frustrations with this initially was, I think we spent about a year, a year and a half debating what inclusive growth meant. I think a lot of people knew what it meant, but we, we got hung up on the terminology. It was even committee reports that came out of Connie came out a year and a half ago with people going, saying, oh, we don't understand what it means, rather than saying, rather than saying what it should have been about. So for me, the inclusive growth approach is really, it's different. It's looking at the economic and social together. And when adding the well-being, that brings much stronger the environmental. It's looking at removing constraints and allowing people to participate more fully in the economy. The, the, this other quote I put in is the well-being economy quote. It's, I'll come back to that as well. It's an OECD report. Uh, and it, it kind of, again, it's stronger, even stronger than the, the words from the First Minister about um, it's not just about growth first and then tidy up later. It's about a different model of growth. And again, as Charlie mentioned, etc. It's, it's about rethinking and reimagining what we're, what we're doing here. So if I can, can I jump back at an inclusive growth space, most of the people in economic development will be familiar with the work that was developed around trying to think about how you operationalise this at the national and local level. It's had most of its success in economic development at the local level. And this was the 5P framework that was developed as part of the North Ayrshire pilot and subsequently it's, it's within the you can, all of this is online on the SCRIG website or in the Scottish Centre for Regional and Inclusive Growth. But it, it, it essentially, it, it links into Charlie's point. So inclusive growth, to me, is how we improve, how we feed into the outcomes and also the wider kind of well-being agenda. It's not a means to an end. It's an approach. And what's really interesting about the inclusive growth approach is it challenges the the economic and the social really strongly. And what we've seen from a lot of the the work when you do this, if you when you do this correctly in a sense, it challenges where you would traditionally spend money. And it makes you think much more holistically and across the piece. But again, people will be familiar with that. So I won't I won't leave on that. Now the, the final kind of bit in this is so we developed an approach, uh, six stage uh, diagnostic which essentially tries to take you through the different uh, different stages of this for for uh, place-based economic development, starting with the data, what are the constraints, uh, what do people on the ground understand? So the, the, the data might seem really obvious, but actually people's perceptions of what's holding back an area uh, could be quite different, and sometimes you need to challenge that and allow people to participate. Obviously, one of the things I should have said in the last slide, the point about the 5P framework and linking it in outcomes is so there's a consistency that links local, regional and national and we can kind of see that feed through through the outcomes. Obviously you would prioritise and operationalise and we've seen that already from the various local authorities and also the city region deals that are starting to look at this much more broadly. So that's just one tool. There's other tools. And I'll say, I'll say just a, I've got a couple more things to say. So on inclusive growth, inclusive growth to me is really a place-based agenda. It works really much better at the local level. When we looked at originally, we looked at doing top-down national. We benchmarked Scotland against other countries and we looked at the constraints. But the variation between local authority areas in Scotland in terms of the constraints, opportunities, challenges is such that there's a real opportunity to kind of do it do it bottom up. It provides different lenses, so you can look at local, regional, rural, you can look at uh, vulnerable groups, and crucially businesses are really important within this as well. There's a real role for business within, within areas, and it's a whole system approach. That's the thing, again, it's got to be whole system, and it's got to involve the, the key players. So, again, there's a lot more about that. If you don't get hung up on the definition and think about uh, practically, what are the constraints? Some of the constraints in areas can be things that we wouldn't traditionally, like well, can the house and it can the transport. But it, it, it often it's a combination of them all in terms of uh, bringing opportunities to areas. So, because I've, I spoke about well-being, I thought, how do we deliver a well-being economy? And in one sense, some of the work that we are doing now is we're looking at. Uh, so there's a, a community wealth building pilot in North Ayrshire, 
it's an interesting approach, which in a sense is a, it looks at the kind of assets within an area, the role of procurement, and different ways of thinking about how you how you build uh, more resilience into your local areas. To me, that's it's a kind of it's a subset of a wider inclusive growth approach. We're looking at piloting the inclusive growth work to develop the additional well-being elements, and for that, that's really about the environmental, the place-based dimensions, having them much more stronger. Uh, again, it's about whole system approach, and it's a, about thinking about how we how we complicate that. So. So in a sense, there's a, there's a lot in this. We're talking about transitions, uh, circular. We're talking about uh, trying to achieve multiple outcomes at different times. So how do we do all of that when you kind of, you're an individual within an organisation? You may be tasked with one particular role. And this is the challenge, I think, for all levels of government. We need to kind of build frameworks up for a better understanding of what the, how these dimensions interact, and how you can how you can have a healthy tension between them, and actually understand the kind of trade off Because otherwise, we will we will keep getting the repeated kind of thinking. Oh, it's a social issue. It's over there. It's an economic economic issue over there, or the environment. That's that's for a different part of the government. And we've got to try and bring and change that that type of uh, thinking. And let me just keep, so Charlie mentioned this, so, so the wellbeing economy work, we've been kind of developing this for about three years. This was, I think, this is where the quote came from, but it's work that was published by the European Council in October. They're looking to develop a horizontal theme for this for the European Union. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not just an academic thing. I'll say a little bit more about how other countries are approaching it as well. So, so this is me kind of jumping on now to what we are doing practically and how we are trying to do this. This is an initiative called Wellbeing Economy Governance. And actually, it started back in um, 2017, 2018. We had an inclusive growth conference in Glasgow. And there was interest from the OECD in bringing other countries in to hear what we were doing. And at that, we had a session on wellbeing. What would wellbeing mean? What is inclusive growth for? And it started conversations with other countries about what they were doing in terms of trying to change their economic system and drive well-being. And I'll, so I'm going to spend about two or three minutes on this, and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up. So the the group the group was uh, I did, there's some pictures for you. The group was uh, as I mentioned the Inclusive Growth Conference in Glasgow, and the picture to the far left. Is the the people on the, the steps beside Adam Smith after the the breakfast session? The middle picture uh, is the group formally being launched at an OECD event uh, the following year in South Korea, and then more recently another picture was an event in Paris. So what it's about is really uh, recognising that the transitions and impacts that are happening in Scotland are, ha are happening in other countries. We are not unique in dealing with either climate change, rising inequality, uh, social disconnections, the kind of hollowing out of the labour market. These are issues that other countries are wrestling with. And a wellbeing framing uh, approach, people are really interested in thinking about how that can be developed. <coughs> so what essentially we've done is we've, we've set up a group uh, with uh, Scotland, Iceland and New Zealand as the kind of main members. And we have interest from a range of different countries in sharing the experience of what they are doing around performance frameworks, around developing system-based approaches, around well-being budgeting, and thinking about how you do, how we do better place-based uh, place-based development. This was a, a policy lab we had in Edinburgh last May. Uh, the woman uh, you won't know is. Uh, Katrine Jacobs Dotier, she was the uh, Prime Minister of Iceland, and the uh, Icelandic officials and New Zealand officials came, and we discussed uh, we discussed basically uh, inclusive growth frameworks, well-being frameworks, how they were doing it nationally and locally to try and drive performance. We talked about sustainable tourism and natural capital. So you might 
not be surprised, but Iceland, Scotland, New Zealand, actually quite a lot of similarities. There's the quite a lot of uh, over congestion in particular tourist areas. New Zealand are introducing a transient levy, I get the right word of this right, tax or whatever. Uh, Iceland are in introducing restrictions on particular sites, uh, capping the load that can go. So if you think of the ferry pools in Isle or um, Sky or whatever, they're doing different approaches. Quite interesting the similarities. So already we've made connections there. We also spoke about child poverty, which again uh, on a well-being scene, uh, some that asked about where where does child poverty fit? Absolutely central to that. Uh, New Zealand have legislated for it. Iceland have a totally different story. They they wouldn't say they don't have it, but they don't have it. I think to the same extent as most other countries. Quite a unique and different. But again, it's about sharing and managing isolates. Just a couple of others. Charlie mentioned this. If you've got nine minutes, it's worth watching. Um, it gives an overview of, it mentions the well-being economy governance, an overview of the type of thinking and reframing that is required to, to kind of re-envision re and change the economy. Scotland more, not just being about wealth, but well-being and all of, all of that. So I'll finish up a couple of slides. So this is the example from uh, I wanted to highlight from New Zealand about the well-being budget. Now, so what can we learn from New Zealand? Probably quite a lot of similarities actually in terms of their, their size and what they do, but they, they brought in the first, what was known internationally as the first well-being budget last year. And what they did was they set aside roughly 2% of their, their budget. So in normal terms, that would be the increment the budget would grow by. They identified five well-being priorities and they, they invited bids from across their government departments. And the bids had to be joined up. The bids, so the health just couldn't bid for it. It had to be health and education, or health and transport, or economy and transport. And then they assessed the bids and allocated this money on a well-being well basis. It was only 2% of the budget, but it was a kind of start to the type of uh, thinking that's required to join up. Uh, portfolios in different different areas of government. Their priorities, uh, I mentioned the five priorities, so you can see uh, Zero Next, one of them, uh, Digital Age is one, the indigenous population was one as well, the, the Marian Pacific uh, populations, child poverty was one, and mental health was one as well. So, so in thinking about wellbeing, you can identify specific priorities and channel those against. I've put alongside, this was some work we've done around Scotland's inclusive growth kind of challenges from the top down, uh, just to put them alongside. And then the question is, what are the wellbeing priorities in Scotland? Again, this was a slide from about uh, a number of months ago, and uh, it's been updated by our, our Cabinet Secretary, who, when she pu published the budget set out, um, the, the focus around net carbon zero emissions, boosting inclusive growth, sustainable places, and tackling child poverty. So, so I suppose getting back to the the central point, the the economic strategy or emerging strategy is one that's not about uh, solely the economy. It's one that can link the economic, social, and environmental can have a framework that allows trade-offs and recognises the, the challenges that are going to come in terms of transitions. As other speakers have said, we've got a lot of assets in Scotland, a lot of opportunities, and we can do this well. Transitions have been done in the past um, much quicker. Uh, if you look at some of the transitions, uh, I've seen some work last, I was at a conference speaking on Saturday, and an environmental economist was showing uh, New York in 1910, and it was a picture of uh, Fifth Avenue, and there was one little car there, and then 13 years later there was it was all cars, and so things can change really, really quickly when there's a central mission and people know what what they're doing. But the the well-being framing, I think, for us is really thinking about providing a framework that can work at the local, regional, and national level 
that, that basically allows people to understand the trade-offs and understand what we have to do in a transition. And it's not about... Uh, when we first published, when we updated the economic strategy in 2015, we got a lot of people saying, why are you talking about inequality in an economic strategy? There was a little bit of pushback from the business organisations and others saying, this really should be strictly about productivity growth. You know, our growth rate's not been as good as it should have been. But actually now that whole, that understanding has changed now and people within the business community really get the, the notion of their role and the community their role in providing well. So we've got to kind of broaden that now further to think about their contribution to solving the challenges we've got around the environment as well and how we manage this, uh, this transition. And all of that local government is absolutely central. The number of things you can do locally, the number of different uh, variations in policies and practices can then be shared elsewhere and scaled up. So really, really important. But anyway, I've, I've tried to keep to time, so I will stop. And uh, thanks very much. No, oh, that's great, Kerry. Thank you. <laughs> and I like the uh, fact that you're talking a lot about transition. So maybe our next theme will be transition to transformation, mm -hmm. um, because that's really what we're talking about in the in the longer term. Uh, and I think all these dimensions that you've woven together are really helpful. I'm sure we have a number of questions again um, for Gary, uh, and the, the mics are round about, I think, uh, yeah, Hannah's got a mic. Um, you just want to make yourself known if you have a question, Katrina first. Hi, uh, Katrina McCauley, North Ayrshire Council. Um, thanks, Gary, for that presentation. I've noticed today and in your presentation there hasn't been a lot said about regional inequality. It clearly featured a lot in the budget this week at a UK level. It seems to be, um, you know, very much influencing national policy, but just interested that it's not really been reflected in a lot of what's been said in, 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 in what you've presented today. Uh, and also when you talk about sort of the bottom-up approach, you know, as you know, in North Ayrshire, we are doing a lot, and the council is investing huge amounts in economic development, proportion to the size of its council and its budgets. I suppose our ask is always, what's national government going to do for areas like North Ayrshire? No, uh, th thanks very much. So I never touched on regional inequalities in this because, in a sense, that was really one of the bases of the, the, the starting strategy about why we were moving to a much more place-based emphasis. I think the UK agenda around levelling up, and the sense we've been calling that out now for a number of years about the challenges of having such an unequal distribution of wealth and opportunity across the UK and the kind of dominance of, of London. So the, re the, the, the levelling up agenda, it's interesting to see what the, the ch potential changes to the Green Book. We would argue that, that an inclusive growth framework gives you a different way to prioritise and make decisions about investment anyway. And the, the Green Book's only one one element of it. So the 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 kind of levelling up the regional dimension is still really strong in Scotland, really strong in our thinking. It's not a dilution in that, it's kind of bringing that environmental side into that as well. So I think in terms of the, the government response, thinking about regional partnerships, the city region deals, how we can build on the capacity across Scotland and and actually linking it to national policy through the performance framework and outcomes in a way that makes it people can see the kind of traction of policies. So so uh, not today, I haven't touched on that, but when uh, when we launched the strategy, I think North Jersey and we we in probably March twenty fifteen we came down to a conference. It was all about regional inequalities then, but that, that agenda is still there, and actually the work that North Ayrshire and others are doing is, is really powerful in illustrating actually you have a lot of the levers to drive change, and actually once you start and bring partners in, then you can create the frameworks to kind of do things that national government can't do. Okay, thanks, Gary. Um, any other questions? Yeah, Observations, comments, and you all get to that point in the day. 
So, the, in a sense, to move away from the kind of narrow market failure uh, definitions around what would traditionally justify government intervention. So, you read the Green Book very carefully. The, there was a presumption against regional investment and levelling up. It was that for a financial return, it had to benefit the national economy. So, in one sense, it was completely moved away from what would traditionally have been a kind of regional policy approach. So they're now changing that because if you take the wider benefits of having a levelling up on the different costs, then it's it's a kind of no-brainer. Okay, that was uh, an interesting uh, dimension. So we thank Gary again for his memories of his event.